Hello, everyone. Welcome to the Science Public Online Talk by Dr. Nirvani Umadad, U of M alumni and dental surgeon. I am Samar Safi Harb, and on behalf of the Faculty of Science at the University of Manitoba, I thank you all for joining us from wherever you are at this time. Before we begin, I acknowledge that we are in Treaty 1 territory and that the U of M campuses are located on traditional territory of Anishinaabe, Cree, Oji Cree, Dakota and Dene peoples and on the homeland of the Métis Nation. Dr. Nirvani Odat is a dental surgeon, healthcare entrepreneur and biotechnologist. After completing her Bachelor's of Science in Microbiology at the U of M in 2007, she pursued a Doctor of Dental Medicine degree at the University of Manitoba. In 2012, she finished a General Practice Residency Program at the University of British Columbia. She's the co-owner and founder of Ascent Dental Care, where her practice focuses on the application of digital dentistry to restorative care. Dr. Nirvani has spent the last 10 years providing volunteer dental care to remote communities around the world. In 2016, with the collaboration of her team members, she developed a digital application to improve access to hospital care in South America. She continues her involvement in clinical research, including studies of the oral microbiome. Nirvani is also a Project Possum Citizen Scientist Astronaut candidate and has been honored as one of Canada's top 100 most powerful women. Today, she's gonna talk about the human holo beyond, the biological communities that make us who we are. The talk will be for 20 minutes, followed by a 20 minute long question answer period. To ask your questions, please go to slido.com and enter the event code 5311. Nirvani, welcome. Over to you. And I should add that Nirvani has no slides, so that's not going to be a technical uh, <laughs> <problem>. <laughs> to avoid any misunderstanding. So uh, the screen is all yours now. Thank you. Thank you for that introduction, Samar. So I just wanted to start this off with uh, a story. And it's of my work about five years ago. I was uh, doing some volunteer work in the Peruvian Amazon and I was doing a dental trip. And when our group arrived, we were welcomed to one of the tribes with a cup of chicha. And it looked like a fermented drink, almost like a tea. It wasn't tea at all. Um, and actually what it is, is it's a drink made by the women of the tribes in the Amazon jungle. And how it's made is they chew yuca, which is the root of uh, cassava. And it's incredibly starchy tuber vegetable. And they chew this until it becomes soft and gummy and then spit the juice into a barrel of Amazonian water. And Amazonian water to all of our Canadian guts is full of microbes that we've never met before. And so this collection of, of starchy, yucca, saliva, Amazonian water is left to sit under the sun, the hot Amazonian sun for several days and ferment. And eventually it becomes this shareable drink called chicha. And the people of the, the tribes like to welcome guests with this drink because they believe that sharing it connects their guests to their communities, as well as enhancing their own immune health. So they drink this regularly. And the interesting thing for me was from their perspective, we as humans need to live in harmony with nature, including all of its microorganisms. Now, given the current situation we've all been navigating with the coronavirus pandemic, I thought it would be worth 
turning our attention inward to discuss what is termed the human holobiont. And I understand this may be a new term for some of you, so I'll just give a brief definition. The term holobiont was coined in 1991 by an MIT researcher. And it describes the collection of human and microbial cells, including bacteria, fungi, and viruses that live within and upon our bodies in long-term long relationships. There are some other smaller organisms that are included in the definition, uh, but for simplicity's sake, uh, we'll call We'll call the organisms within the holobiont bacteria, fungi, and viruses. Now, you may be asking why this is important or why it's relevant for us. The relevance is that these non human bacterial, viral, and fungal cells have been estimated to outnumber our human cells at a ratio of about 10 to 1 meaning that for each human cell, there are 10 non-human cells that contribute to who we are. And when we look at the human genome, the collection of genes within our human cells, the number gets up to around 20,000 genes. When we consider the hollow genome or the genome of all human, and microbial cells, we're now looking at a gene set of over 33 million genes. So the contribution that these organisms have to our own humanness can't be overlooked. And we can almost think of our own human cells as a scaffold for the microbial ecology that develops within and upon us. The general idea that a germ, whether it's a bacteria, a fungus, or a virus, causes a disease is based on something called germ theory. Germ theory was developed in the 1800s and then popularized in the mid 1800s by Louis Pasteur. It has since dominated in science and medicine as the prevailing theory behind many diseases and infection. However, at the time Pasteur was working on this theory, another scientist by the name of Antoine Béchamp was working on a rival theory called bioterrain theory. This theory stated that disease was actually caused by an imbalance between the organisms in our body and the environment of those organisms. At the time he proposed this theory, Antoine Béchamp was essentially laughed at and the theory was thought to be nonsense. Germ theory triumphed. However, today, as we better understand things like the hollow biont and the fact that we are teeming with microorganismal cells, it makes sense to shift towards a model of science where we start to consider all of these microorganisms and the relationships that they have amongst each other and with our own human cells when we start to talk about our health. Today, the term germ elicits the idea of disease, decay, or dirtiness. However, the etymology of the word germ means something that initiates development or growth. We see this when we consider developmental biology and things like the germ cells, which ultimately become the reproductive cells that are our egg and sperm cells and are absolutely the origin of something else. We also see this in the germ cell layers of the embryo, which 
ultimately divide and become the physical human form for who we are. Again, in this context, German deed represents the development of something new. I see this as interesting to apply to the study of the hollow biont because we can start to look at microbial cells that typically are associated with disease through a new set of eyes and consider how their interactions lead to our multi-organismal development. The concert of cellular interactions in our bodies is so intricate and finely coordinated. For the trillions of cells that make up our bodies, there are trillions of cellular interactions, processes and communications happening at any given time. Our cells, including our microbiomes, have developed some incredibly clever ways of communicating with one another, even in non-local relationships. For example, cells communicate with one another through chemicals, hormones, proteins. We're now finding the release and perceptibility of biophotons having a role in the stress response of certain cells, particularly bacteria. And even more interestingly, horizontal gene transfer occurring between these cells whereby genetic material is passed on to cells in a horizontal manner, meaning that replication isn't required. And genetic material can be transferred to cells for things like cellular repair or just to confer some type of biological advantage. Now, when we disturb or we interfere with these ecological populations, it can have negative effects. There have been studies done on small animals, particularly crustaceans, whereby the natural microbiome is altered using antibiotics and certain bacterial populations are diminished. And then the altered microbiome is injected into germ-free versions of the animal. And its development is monitored. Ultimately, the development tends to be slower and generally impaired compared to the development of an animal with a full complement of its microbial ecology. We're at the tip of the iceberg when it comes to understanding these interactions, but we are understanding more and more about how they impact our overall health. The majority of research has focused on bacteria because of their ubiquity within our bodies, but there is a shift in research attempting to better understand how fungal and viral populations also impact how we develop. Gut health has been an incredibly prevalent topic in the health and nutrition space recently. And the lesser known thing is that the first part of the gut or the digestive tract is our mouths. So when we discuss gut health, trying to achieve it and maintain it, we really need to be focused on our oral or our dental health as well and how to cultivate health in that environment. Our mouths host over 700 different types of microbes, including bacteria, fungi, and viruses. Each of these 700 different microbes exists totaling hundreds of millions of microorganisms, all living in our mouth in perfect health. So this is in a healthy mouth. I'm going to briefly include some examples here of how the oral microbiome impacts our overall health and has impacts at distant spots to the mouth. Now, dental disease, which can be classified 
but not limited to cavities, gingivitis, periodontitis, arise from imbalances in these over 700 different types of microorganisms. Dysbiosis of these microbes results in acidic metabolites that can eat through the hardest structure in our bodies, tooth enamel. The enamel breakdown causes tooth decay, which leads to localized and eventually generalized microbial changes. Specifically, the bacteria Streptococcus mutans, paired with the fungus Candida albicans, continue breakdown of tooth structures. And once the, the enamel has been eroded, underlying structures continue to erode more quickly. Our teeth are like their own small little organs with a hard outer casing and nerve, blood supply, and nutrient channels within it that can all be invaded by microorganisms. The teeth are housed within the periodontium, which are the supporting gum, ligament, and bone structures for teeth all of which can also become inflamed or destroyed by microbial dysbiosis. When the bone and gum tissues start to see changes in the microorganismal populations, these highly vascularized gum structures become an easy route for bacteria, fungus, and viruses to enter the bloodstream. Studies have actually shown that patients with periodontitis or inflammation of the periodontium in the mouth and cardiovascular disease have had oral bacteria lodged into their atherosclerotic plaques. Oral microbes also play an important role in nitrate metabolism. Nitrates can be found in many different types of foods and naturally are primarily found in dark leafy green vegetables, but are also found as preservatives in many foods today. A collection of microbes in the mouth break these nitrates down into nitrites, which are then further broken down into nitric oxide, which has the beneficial effects on our body of dilating or widening our blood vessels so that blood pressure is decreased and improving the endothelial lining of our blood vessels so that platelet aggregation and overall coagulation of the blood is prevented. Further in our large intestine, dietary fiber is fermented by bacteria that produce a short chain fatty acid called butyrate. Butyrate has the ability to improve our intestinal lining by reinforcing the tight junctions between our cells and overall improving our gut health. And people with IBS or irritable bowel syndrome or Crohn's disease have been found to have lower levels of these butyrate producing bacteria contributing to their gut sensitivity. Now, Alzheimer's disease is also linked to oral bacteria. And although it's a multifactorial condition, its onset and development has been linked to elevated inflammatory biomarkers such as C-reactive protein and the cytokine interleukin-6. Periodontal disease and particularly the colonization of P. gingivalis a keystone bacteria for periodontal disease have been linked to elevated levels of these C-reactive protein and interleukin-6 biomarkers in the blood. The bacteria has been found in the brain of Alzheimer's patients, and this is where the link between the two has been found. It produces a toxic enzyme that breaks down proteins necessary for neuron function and overall 
causes neuronal inflammation, contributing to the progression of Alzheimer's. The last example I'll include here as a link between uh, oral and systemic bacterial health is within our lungs. And this is particularly relevant now uh, where I think a lot of people are concerned with respiratory health. Our lungs, which were once thought to be sterile spaces, are in fact not sterile and do have microbial populations in health. And healthy lungs, in terms of their microorganisms, closely resemble the mouth due to the fact that we are micro-aspirating or constantly aspirating small amounts from the fluid in our mouths into the lungs. So in health, oral bacteria can generally be found in lung fluid. And the lungs play an important role in obviously air exchange, but obvious, or, but alternatively us maintaining general health. Dominant bacteria such as Prevotella and Fusobacteria are found in health. And when we see these bacteria in oral populations, we can generally infer adequate lung health. Now, I realize this is a general overview of a very, very complex topic, but the takeaway is that we have the ability to contribute and cultivate environments within our body, and particularly from what happens in our mouth that have an impact on our systemic health or have an impact on our overall health. We need microorganisms to be in balance with our own cells. And we need this to be the healthiest versions of ourselves. So we can use our ability to cultivate these environments and promote our own health. Thank you. Hey, thank you very much, Nirvani, for a, a fantastic uh, and interesting talk. We already have some questions for you. Okay. Uh, I don't know if you can see them, but I'll also read them to you. Uh, so the first question is from Shabnit. Uh, what are some of the challenges you faced as a woman entrepreneur? Um, that is an interesting question. I, you know, I think as an entrepreneur, you, you face challenges. I think that's kind of the nature of being an entrepreneur is, is you're kind of constantly dealing with challenges. And to be very honest, I don't know that I've necessarily felt that I face specific challenges because I'm a woman. I definitely, I've faced challenges because I was doing things that maybe not everyone was doing or because I was focused in areas that not everyone was focused in. But I think if you want to enter the space, the world of entrepreneurship, regardless of, of who you are and, and where you're coming from, the idea that you'll have challenges that you just know are going to be a part of your journey is something you need to be prepared for. And I think that realization that, that you're always going to have something to overcome makes the, the identity or the, the identification with who you are actually fall secondary to what you're doing. Thank you. Um, the next question, what's the difference between the holobiont and the microbiome? So the holobiont includes 
human cells. So the, the microbiome, maybe I'll start there because that's a more familiar term, but the microbiome includes generally um, bacterial cells, viral particles and fungal cells. And when we talk about the microbiome, we're typically talking about the interaction of all of those things um, and the genetic components of all of those things. The holobiont includes human cells with bacteria, viruses, and fungal cells as well, and the interaction of those with human cells. So the holobiont is essentially the interaction between the microbiome and human cells. Great, thank you. Uh, next question. Uh, during pregnancy, a woman is more susceptible to gum disease and cavities. Is there a disruption to the oral microbiome that may be linked to this? Yeah, so there, there are uh, several different reasons for that. Uh, there also are obviously hormonal changes, a host of hormonal, hormonal changes happening that increase inflammatory biomarkers for women during pregnancy. But typically or generally, when a woman is pregnant, uh, the acidity in their mouth increases, and that is usually because of a shift in the bacterial populations. So uh, the development or the, the proliferation of anaerobic bacteria, which we always have in our mouth, um, shifts to a higher proportion versus the aerobic bacteria. And anaerobic bacteria are typically found in the deep layers of our gum tissue um, as they need to be because they obviously don't, don't wanna be uh, bombarded with oxygen. But when these anaerobic bacteria start to populate the, the oral cavity in greater amounts, the acidity levels due to their metabolites shift in the mouth and that also contributes to inflammation and to tooth erosion or tooth decay or cavities. All right, thanks. Next question. Are there currently any probiotic on the market that has been proven to be beneficial for oral health? This is actually a really good question. Um, I have been looking into this for the past several months, actually, with a, a colleague of mine to try and see if there is anything on the market that genuinely has some, some research or some evidence behind it as being beneficial specifically for oral health um, and to be put in oral products. And so the short answer is right now, nothing that is evidence-based, um, no. But in general, probiotics are generally found to be beneficial in particular if they contain the lactobacillus bacteria. Um, and also if you're using a small dose prebiotic with the probiotic, that is more so for general health, for specifically oral health, uh, nothing yet, no. Oh, okay. Uh, next question. What advice do you have for science students who hope to make a difference in the healthcare field? Uh, I, I would say that you, you should probably find within yourself why you're doing what you're doing. So I think when you're in school, um, you're busy and you're studying and you're working really hard and it becomes very easy to get caught up in all of that uh, and to want to achieve things and to want to have certain accolades and to get good grades and all of those things. But I think if you look within yourself to find why you're doing something, it makes the it makes the doing a lot easier. So it makes the actual actions behind everything you do easier to fulfill. And paths start opening up for you because you've created this space of awareness in yourself for, for how you're gonna make an impact on on the world and on healthcare. And as much as we like to be very data-driven and evidence-based in science, 
the the best scientists allow their creativity creativity and creative creative sides to flow and that's how you come up with really innovative creative ideas to help your patients or you know to help help the world in general and so i think just really knowing yourself and knowing why you you want to do what it is you want to do is a really important place to start for for everybody excellent next question um since probiotics are mainly bacteria, should we be concerned with the issue of horizontal transfer of resistance genes? That is a good question. I think I, the short answer would be, I don't believe so, but that's mainly because uh, horizontal, horizontal gene transfer is, it's, non-selective in a sense and selective in another sense. So um, genes can be transferred or released into the cellular environment. But because just because that happens, it doesn't necessarily mean that they'll be reintegrated into another cell. So uh, with, with the use of something like probiotics, um, there isn't necessarily the consequence that the probiotic is going to release something that your human cells, your, your own innate cells, is going to pick up and then reintegrate into genetic material. I think, you know, that's an interesting consideration, but there's nothing that I've seen that has shown that. And I think just the nature of horizontal gene transfer doesn't necessitate that that will happen. Thank you. Uh, two questions from David. Do you have any special awards in your high school years? And what would you say to an aspiring dentist? Um, special awards in my high school years. Um, I guess I, that, that's a long time ago. So I'm going, <laughs> going back a few years, but I did, I received several scholarships. So um, I don't remember the names of, of all the scholarships I received, but I did receive several scholarships, which was nice that that really helped out with, um, with first year university or U1 for me at the time. Um, what I would say to somebody who is an aspiring dentist is um, it, it's an amazing career. So I'll say that. Uh, but I would also say, I mean, for me, I didn't always know that I wanted to be a dentist. I was in, I was actually in my first year of university and I was taking a lot of science courses and, you know, wasn't sure exactly what direction I wanted to go into. And what made a really big difference for me was actually shadowing a dentist. I, at the time I shadowed my dentist. And so that's what I would suggest is, is you uh, find a dentist who or if you know a dentist who would like to mentor you and sort of take you under their wing, um, spend some time in their office, spend some time observing what it is they do and see if, if it's something that's for you. It's, you know, it's a great career, but it also involves balancing a lot and, and juggling a lot of different things at the same time. And so um, it, it's not necessarily for everybody. And I think, Part of knowing if it's for you is actually seeing, a, you know, a day in the life. Thanks. Um, what was the best personal and scientific realization you had from your astronaut training? Um, the best or the most profound realization I think I had um, was How, how interesting it was. So when I went to, and I was actually uh, talking with Samara about this a couple of days ago, but when I went to, um, to the Project Possum training, there were people from all different backgrounds there. Um, very, very impressive people from all over the world, but people from different backgrounds nonetheless. So from the medical field, from the aerospace industry, from the 
there was a geologist there. There was a navigator from the US military. So people who had knowledge in all different areas came together. Um, and I think that is kind of the whole point of, of that program and of how innovation in general happens is you want to cultivate open-mindedness to new ideas that come from a place that you can't come from because you just you don't know certain things you don't know everything and my biggest realization was was the value that that has when you're really trying to do something big so you know you're trying to go to space you're trying to create a culture where going to space is just a, a, a part of our lives for example, um, you want people from different backgrounds to come together and bring their own unique perspectives to things. And so I think just appreciating how much of a role diversity and inclusion and openness to, to new ideas really does play when it comes to genuinely innovating. Excellent, totally agree. Next question, are you related question on the astronaut thing? Are you still trying to be an astronaut? What do you think of SpaceX and commercial space travel? Um, so for, to, the, to the first question, I, I don't know, to be very honest, if I was ever necessarily trying to be an astronaut. Um, but what I was doing and what I'm still doing um, is trying to contribute to the the body of knowledge that we have when it comes to um, space science. And for me specifically, it was space physiology. And um, so, so through programs that are even being run here in Canada with the Canadian Space Agency, through uh, Project Possum and through NASA, there are opportunities to do that. And so, um, that is interesting to me is is doing research that contributes to that space and i think in general the idea of commercial space flight is amazing i i think that you know we should be able to explore different parts of of our universe and we should be able to bring together human ingenuity to do that and we should be pushing the limits of what we think is possible and so i think that that's amazing but i also think that there are still a lot of things here on earth that we can continue to understand and we can continue to develop our knowledge in and so i i appreciate the i think it's like this innate human wanting to explore and i absolutely appreciate that and i think it's it's amazing that people are developing it so robustly but I think here on Earth, we, we can still do a lot of, of exploring here as well and, and bring ingenuity to places that um, have, have kind of lost it in some ways. And do you want to comment on the commercial space travel? Commercial space? Yes. Yeah, so commercial space travel, I do. I, I think that commercial space flight is is a magnificent thing and uh, I am glad that it's becoming something that is that I believe will will be a possibility for us within the next 15 years commercial space flight will absolutely be something that is part of our lives all right next from John how do you balance your work and personal life is there anything you hope could improve in that aspect um, I, I think I've gotten better at it over, <laughs> over time. Um, I, to be honest, um, I, if you ask other people around me, I, I think everyone would say I'm always busy and that's probably true. But I think one thing that has genuinely really, really deeply helped me is meditating. And uh, I know it's it's not necessarily for everybody, but I think what it's done for me is it gives me some time to quiet my my mind and um, sort of just remove myself from the world for a few moments every day. And the power of that, like the power of reconnecting to yourself and eliminating a lot of your mind chatter, 
I think has this almost exponential effect on how you then go back out into the world and, and interact with other people and perform your job and perform your studies. Um, and so I think I, I can always, I, I think we can all always improve, you know, how we show up every day. But for me, something that's made a big difference in my life has been that has been meditation. And it's not necessarily for everybody. Um, but I would say that everyone should try it and, and see if it's something that you can get into. So for how many minutes a day do you do? What do you think? I, I meditate for 20 minutes every day when i started i didn't i probably meditated for 20 seconds at a time but i do now i do i wake up early so i do wake up very early and it's the first thing i do is i i meditate when i wake up i have to say i try to do one minute a day and it really helps <laughs> Even yeah. One minute. Yeah. yeah and you know when i started that's what i did i i said okay i'm gonna do this for five minutes every day and that's what i would try and do and i maybe ended up doing one minute yeah, <laughs> yeah it, it's it does help you quiet down. Yes. Yeah. Go back yeah. to your thoughts. Yeah. Thank you. Um, the next and last question, and after that we're gonna stop. Um, how difficult was it to get your business going? Um, I so so there are uh, two businesses that I have, and so I can speak to this question on both aspects of of each business. Um, so I own a dental clinic. And I purchased that, that that was a business that existed and then I took it over. So I purchased an existing existing dental clinic and then I've I've now made it into my own, but it was something that existed. Um, and the business itself was up and running and functional. And so from that perspective, the, the business worked. Uh, the most difficult part of this business though was you know, really just making it feel like it was it was something that was mine and it had my a culture that I wanted to cultivate and I had a team that I was excited about. And so I think that um, in any business, that's probably the most challenging thing is is really defining why you're doing it, defining what about the things that you do is important and how you're going to convey that to all of the people that make up your team who also have to make everyone who either interacts with you as a client, as a customer, as a patient, feel the essence of your business as well. So everyone with you, working with you, has to believe the things that, that you want them to believe about this business. So um, that is a, a difficult thing in any business. And then I also am part of a startup, um, and it's a, a digital startup or a tech startup and we initially we very roughly kind of built the platform out um, we had some developers help us do that and then disseminated it amongst different hospitals within south america and so and the, and the reason it ended up being south america is because uh one of my partners is is from there so she's in london now but originally was from there and um that was difficult just in the sense that it was such a different world. I, I don't have a technical background as far as software development um, or coding or any of that stuff. I, I you know, I don't live in South America. Also a challenge to try and build something remotely like this. Um, and so I think the biggest challenge there was learning as much as I could learn to feel like I was effective for myself and for my team, but then also finding people who could help us build, again, the thing we wanted to build and have the impact that we wanted to have with what we were doing. So ultimately, I think, you know, one business was sort of a traditional business that I have. Another one is a startup. Um, there are challenges with both of them, but I think in any business, it's really creating something of value and conveying that value to the people around you and building a strong team that is going to help you fulfill your vision. All right, great. So that ends uh, 
to talk for this session. Thank you so much, Nirvani, for sharing with us your passion, your experience, your advice. Um, you have a quite very interesting and impressive uh, career path. We hope you can continue sharing this with our science students. Um, and we wish you continued success. So I'll clap on behalf of everyone. Thank for, you. Uh, joining us today. Um, and that happened to be the very last talk of the summer spot series. So thank you everyone also for um, uh, joining us. Um, and I would like to um, mention uh, that uh, given that the summer series is over, I'd like to thank again our spot team uh, shown here, uh, Chris Takra, Vicky Harris, uh, Andrew Popiel, and Jennifer McRae. Uh, who did a lot of work to make this series uh, possible. So thank you for all what you are doing. And also thank you to all of the uh, speakers for the summer series. Uh, we've had all these amazing uh, speakers and talks. Uh, they're all posted on YouTube. So if you go to the SPOT website shown here, if you've missed any talk or you wanna see a, the talk again, uh, there's YouTube links and these can be viewed uh, again. So thank you everyone for your generous time and for helping us uh, make this series accessible to everyone. Um, and so uh, we will resume. So I hope everyone will enjoy whatever is left from the summer. Uh, we will resume um, in the fall, uh, the Faculty of Science interdisciplinary series, uh, except for this fall, it will be online. And the very first talk will be on equity, diversity, and inclusion uh, by an, uh, a champion in the subject, uh, Dr. Imogen Coey from Ryerson, uh, who's going to give her uh, seminar on September 18th. So please stay tuned. And until then, I wish you a wonderful rest of summer and a great and smooth start of the fall season. Thank you and take care. Stay safe. Thank you Bye. so much. Thanks Thank a lot. Take care. Bye. Bye. Thank you for having me. My pleasure.